Hello, CBF of Virginia. This is Mark Snipes, and I have the honor and privilege of sitting down uh, for a few minutes with Paul Baxley, the Executive Director of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Paul, we're so grateful that you would take this time uh, just so that we can get to know you a little better. Well, Mark, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have this time with you and all of our friends in CBF of Virginia. Uh, early uh, in my tenure at CBF, I had the chance to visit Virginia and you and Terry and Rob Fox and I got to travel around the state and meet a lot of people in a short amount of time. And I got back once or twice more before the pandemic, but it's been too long. And I'm looking forward to a time when we can be together in person again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Traveling again and being hotel rooms again and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, it's strange what you come to miss, you know. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. Well, just uh, as we get to know you a little better, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Mark. I was born and raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, my parents are both teachers. So my dad is a retired mathematics professor at Wake Forest. Uh, I definitely did not get the math gene, just in case anybody wants to know. And my mother was an elementary school teacher. So I grew up in a family of educators. Uh, I have one sister, and she became a, an elementary school teacher and still is one today as an outstanding uh, teacher in the Winston-Salem Versailles County School System. So I guess I'm the rebel. Uh, I, I'm the one who did not go directly into education. Um, so education was important in my family growing up, but so was church. Uh, my very earliest memories in life involved going to church. Uh, during my growing up years, our family was held membership in two different congregations in Winston-Salem. Uh, from the time I was born till uh, not long after I was baptized, uh, we were members of Wake Forest Baptist Church on the campus of Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. Um, the late Dr. Warren Carr was the pastor of that church in my childhood. Um, some of my earliest memories in life involved going to church there. Probably my first great adversity was it going to church there because when I was in the two or the two year old nursery, uh, apparently I got into a scrape up with some of the other kids in the in the nursery and I ended up breaking my leg and being wheeled around in a wagon and a three quarter body cast for like six months. Wow. Um, you know, when I was two or three years of age. Uh, but I also remember being in Sunday school. I remember being in worship. Uh, I remember my first chances as an elementary school child to be a worship leader by carrying the Bible into that massive worship space or by being an acolyte. Um, and I distinctly remember being baptized in that huge cavernous sanctuary on the, on the Wake Forest campus. Um, when I was about 10 years old, our family moved our membership uh, to First Baptist Church in downtown Winston-Salem. And my, my parents uh, wanted to do that even though they loved Wake Forest Baptist Church, they believed my sister and I would have more opportunities uh, at First Baptist because of the size of their children's and youth ministries. And um, although I really struggled with that decision when we made it, um, I can look back and see grace in it because I had some opportunities at First Baptist Church that were really important for my lifelong trajectory that I probably wouldn't have had if we had not made that move. Um, but uh, my parents are still members of First Baptist Church in Winston-Salem. Um, uh, my dad was on the pastor search committee in 1991 that called David Hughes, and my mom was on the pastor search committee uh, back in 2000, I guess, 14 or 15, that called Emily Hull McGee to be the pastor of that church. So uh, my parents have been involved in the calls of the last two pastors. I say all that to say uh, church was really important uh, in our family growing up alongside education. Um, I went to college at Wake Forest University. Um, by the time I got there, I was already considering whether or not I was called to ministry. I'd had some very formative experiences later in high school in my youth group. Uh, I kind of had an inclination that maybe I was called to the ministry, but I wasn't willing to, to name that in public. And so I, I, I went to college uh, with the intention of majoring in history because I loved history, I loved politics things like that. And uh, I figured if I was going to seminary, I could study all the, um, the Bible and theology later. Hmm. But in those days at Wake Forest, you had to take a religion class. And so in the fall of my freshman year, I took Introduction to the New Testament, figuring if I had to take calculus and I had to take Spanish, I ought to take something that would be an easy A for me. And I'd been in Baptist Sunday school my whole life. So Intro to the New Testament just had to be the perfect thing for me. Absolutely. Um, 
it was perfect, but not for the reasons I'd imagined. Uh, that class opened my eyes to a whole, I would argue, uh, deeper and different ways of engaging the scripture and being engaged by the scriptures. I first discovered what it might really mean to love God with all my mind, as well as heart and will and action. And once I got in that class, I couldn't say no to doing more. Mm. Um, and so I ended up, I kept the history major, but I also uh, double majored in religion and uh, by, the t by the time I reached my senior year at Wake Forest, I was ready to actively consider seminaries, but the year was 1991. <laughs> and the Baptist world was changing around me. Um, when I was a kid at First Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, um, I remember our youth choir, Mark, would sing for Sunday night services, which meant I got to be there when we had the monthly Sunday night church business meeting. Oh. And I can still remember that church being called into conference to vote on motions to recommend somebody to the seminary. And nobody even had to ask what the seminary was because it was Southeastern. Our former pastor, Dr. Randall Lolly, had been the president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. No self-respecting daughter or son of that church would dare go anywhere else. And so, you know, not that... Um, not that far removed from 1991, back in the early to mid 80s, I still remember that happening. But by the time I graduated from Wake Forest, that was just not an option hmm. if I was gonna be true to my conscience. Um, and the options frankly weren't clear. <laughs> I mean, what we now refer to as our young Baptist ecosystem didn't exist. Most of the schools with whom we partner today either didn't exist at all or didn't have Baptist studies programs. BTSR and Truett were getting ready to admit their very first classes. The Baptist House at Duke was in a much earlier period in its, its life. And I really didn't know where to go. And so I visited some schools, had some opportunities kind of outside Baptist life, didn't have final clarity about any of them. So I did nothing for a year. I, um, well, I didn't do nothing. I was the interim youth minister for my home church well, I waited for some clarity about what I should do. And after doing that for almost a year, um, I had the opportunity to go to Duke Divinity School with the, under, with the understanding that at the same time, I would serve a congregation about an hour away from Duke, the First Baptist Church of Henderson, North Carolina. In fact, I served them as their associate minister, and I started there before I started at Duke. I kind of got established there for a year. Um, and then I started going to school part-time while doing ministry full-time because that was the only way I could see to make sense of the rapidly changing um, denominational conflict context that was around me and the conflict that was still uh, in just overwhelming a lot of Baptist congregations I knew. Going to Duke was a tremendous gift because it opened me to the truth that there were Baptists who did not come from the South. Hmm. And there were Baptists who were not white and there was a bigger Christian world out there, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, and I had a chance to be in classes with, with people from all of those parts of the Christian tradition, to fall in love with the beauty of all those traditions, but also to come to terms with why I, at my core, am a Baptist Christian. <laughs> so I came out of Duke simultaneously more ecumenically minded and more Baptist uh, than I was when I went in served that church in Henderson, North Carolina for seven years. So I finished the degree at Duke, served there several more years, uh, left Henderson in 1999 to be the campus minister at Wingate University for a couple of years. Um, while I was the campus minister there, I was also the interim preacher at Wingate Baptist Church. So that congregation was the first congregation that had the, um, how shall I put this, opportunity, burden, whatever, <laughs> of hearing me preach on an almost weekly basis. And I, and I thank God for them every day because preaching is a practice and without any practice, you don't have any chance to, to grow. And, and they gave me a chance to really, to really practice. Um, left Wingate, served at Baptist Seminary at Richmond for a couple of years, uh, during and after my doctor of ministry work there. Um, was called back to Henderson in 2004 to be the church's pastor. And then I, in 11 years ago, about now, uh, we were discerning a call to Georgia, where I was being called to be the pastor at First Baptist Athens. And just over two years ago, this crazy thing happened. 
<laughs> um, and I was called to be executive coordinator of Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. While in Wingate, I met uh, Jennifer, uh, to whom we, I was married a couple of years later. Um, she's a physical therapist. Uh, she's also a lifelong Baptist uh, who grew up in CBF. And we have four children. Uh, the oldest is a first semester, first year college student at the University of Georgia. Then we have a uh, seventh grade daughter and boy, girl, fourth grade, grade twins. Wow. So that may be more than you wanted. That may be less than you wanted. But I'm going to stop and breathe now and see what you'd like to ask more about or uh, no, where you'd like to take this next. I've learned some things through that. So thanks for sharing that. That was great. So a lot of people don't know that you lived in Virginia. Um, tell us more about your connections here. So in 1999, um, toward the end of my first uh, season at First Baptist Henderson, uh, I was feeling the need for more education. And I chose to apply for the Doctor of Ministry program at Baptist Seminary at Richmond. Um, and was fortunate enough to be admitted to that program. Um, that program was life-changing, grace-filled, challenging, and transformative for me. Hmm. It gave me the kinds of uh, formational experiences that, as someone of almost 30 years of age, I was ready for that I wouldn't have been ready for when I was a 24, 25-year-old MDF student. Um, there were incredible faculty uh, the cohort I entered that program with, um, which is a remarkable community. And when I, you know, when I went into that program, <laughs> I was essentially completely isolated from the larger CBF world. I hadn't been able to go to General Assembly, Mark, because I was a youth minister. Mm. And so when they have a General Assembly every year, I was on a mission trip. Right. You can't go to General Assembly if you're taking 60 kids to Oklahoma on a mission trip. <laughs> they just don't, those things don't stack up real well. Um, and I hadn't had a chance to really even get involved too much in state CBF life in North Carolina in its first several years because of school and work and other things. And so I came to my late 20s really in need not only of more education and more spiritual formation, but means of connection. And the doctor ministry program at Baptist Seminary at Richmond was all those things. Hmm. And then some. Um, so my first connections, uh, with Virginia were, was a, a BTSR student who had come to Richmond twice a year for the then three week in-person cohort experiences. Um, in the midst of that journey, uh, Dr. Graves, who was then the president and became the primary advisor for my DMN project and Bob Spinks, who was then the development director ask me to work with them in imagining a grant proposal to Lily. Lily had put out another round of grant proposals or, or grant invitations around helping high school students to explore their vocation. And BTSR wanted to respond, but they knew that as Baptists, we couldn't do what the Methodists and Presbyterians are doing because congregations own that for us more than denominations do. And so, um, they invited me first to talk to them about what I might do, and then they invited me to help write the grant and convene a, a process, a collaborative process that involved uh, two universities, CBF, um, Passport, <laughs> and some others to create what became the Samuel Project. And um, so I was uh, doing some contract work for BTSR, still from North Carolina. And when that grant was funded in the summer of, oh goodness, 2002, uh, Dr. Graves invited me to join the BTSR staff full time. And I, and I spent two years actually living in Virginia. Um, I had a chance to travel across Virginia representing BTSR, to go really across the country representing BTSR. <laughs> Some of the rhythms and experiences that are really essential to the work I do now I first started to explore at BTSR. Hmm. But more than that, um, the connections and the relationship that put me on a journey for better or for worse to this place were set in motion at BTSR. Because when I went to BTSR, I was basically an isolated, disconnected Baptist who didn't have any of the alumni connections that my older colleagues who'd gone to Southern or Southwestern or Southeastern had. And I had not been in the entering classes at BTSR or Truett. So 
from a community standpoint, from a vocational standpoint, from an impact, just a, a healthy kind of um, growth standpoint, uh, those years at BTSR and in Virginia were just incredibly, incredibly powerful and formative. And uh, I still meet folks uh, who I encountered first during that time. Um, and so it's, it's odd to look back and recognize now that 20 years have passed since that work was done. But yes, I lived in Virginia for, for two years uh, while I did that work before coming back to North Carolina to be a pastor. Well, one of the things I was uh, really impressed with about you was that you understood kind of how big Virginia is and how diverse it is. And this story really helps me understand um, kind of how you under understand that from a, a really deep level. Yes, when I was at BTSR, I had a chance um, to travel uh, really all over Virginia and see the diversity of congregations and contexts. Um, and, and that was that was a really um, that really came to serve me well later on um, for all the reasons you're you're suggesting. Yeah. Well, you know, we really are still grieving the loss of BTSR, um, but we are so excited about our new partnerships with uh, Union Prez and with uh, Baptist Seminary at Kentucky. Mm. Most of the people listening to this uh, interview won't know that you were one of the people who helped spearhead the process of getting us uh, to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a large group of pastors that met for over a year talking about what are we going to do about theological education. Um, and I think the best possible scenarios happened, and we are mm -hmm. so excited about it. What did you learn about Virginia and Virginia pastors through that process? Mark, there's so many reasons. I'm glad we were invited to be part of that process. Um, it's, you know, I don't, it's not the last such of those processes that we'll be involved in across CBF, uh, more generously defined over the next several years, I feel sure. Um, I was really impressed with the quality of pastoral leadership in Virginia that I met in that process. And, you know, you and Terry, and Michael Chuck identified the people who served on that team that we worked with. And that was, as it should have been, you all knew the state and uh, um, the personalities and the opportunities better than we would have from Decatur. And um, it was a wonderful blend of really experienced CBF pastors in Virginia and folks who'd come to the state more recently and folks who were serving in central Virginia and folks who were serving further away. I would, I was reflecting on this uh, in preparation for our conversation today, Mark, and I think in hindsight, uh, one of the things that impresses me most about that process is that in spite of everything else that was going on around us and around each of those pastors as that process got to a real, I mean, so that process reached a really serious stage last March, right? Right. And, you know, it would have been really easy for uh, CBF Virginia's leadership, CBF Global, and especially those pastors say, you know what? The world's turned upside down three times. We can't pay attention to this process. Absolutely. But no one suggested that. I mean, maybe a participant occasionally missed a Zoom meeting, but there was always a really good reason. And it took us a little bit longer than we had first hoped. Uh, that was partly because of the pandemic and partly because we had some really strong uh, proposals to consider from theological schools. Um, but I, you know, I thought it was remarkable and still think it was remarkable that in the midst of everything that group of pastors was facing in the early and middle stages of the coronavirus pandemic against the backdrop of, um, you know, hundreds of years of racial injustice being laid bare in ways that it couldn't be avoided. And the partisanship of the 2020 election cycle starting to foment more and more. I mean, we, I mean, everybody in that process was caught between multiple pandemics. And it would have been really easy to retreat. But everyone stayed engaged. And I think it's because they recognized that what we were living through was even more evidence of the urgency of the conversation we were trying to have. And on the other side of the this pandemic season, um, Baptist uh, CBF related Baptists in Virginia were going to need new theological education partners. It also should be mentioned, Mark, that before there were any pandemics, um, 
when we were setting goals in December, in January for the process, the group named things like capacity for agility, <laughs> proven track record preparing congregational leaders, commitments to things like racial justice and multivocational ministry and rural ministry. I mean, you go back and you read the notes from December of 2019, and you see what that group of leaders was already thinking about before the pandemic intensified all of them. I, I think that's a really um, Im impressive sign of dis the discerning capabilities of that group of pastors. In other words, they, they were already seeking something innovative and faithful and agile even before that was everybody's language in the air. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is the quality of pastoral leadership we engaged in that process should give us all a reason to be hopeful and faithfully confident about where CDF is in Virginia now and in the future. You know, I, I'd be glad to call uh, any of those people my pastor. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and my respect for and admiration for them only increase. So yes, it was a it was encouraging, um, challenging in good ways, inspiring to be part of that effort. And I, I'm grateful we had the chance. Yeah. So this process started pretty early on in your tenure, mm -hmm. um, in your current position. So yes. how will what happened in Virginia um, help shape and model future conversations about theological education for CBF? So <laughs> I think it's one of the reasons that I was open to getting involved in this process in Virginia is because I thought that it would not be a one and done standalone experience. That as um, the world of theological education continued to change and as congregational life continued to change, um, that there would be more and more need for us to be both conveners of new approaches to preparing ministers and also uh, advocates for that. Um, and even, bef you know, even before we started this process, uh, thanks to a generous grant from the Ball Foundation, we had already been convening conversations with leaders of theological schools and leaders of congregations about the shape of what kind of shape the relationship between congregations and theological schools should take going forward. Um, and so, I mean, we've had other CBS state and regional organizations reached out to us both during and after the Virginia process about being involved in helping them assess needs and opportunities in the same way. And so lessons we learned in approaching the, the opportunity of Virginia will uh, have influence beyond Virginia. And I, you know, I, I fully expect that there'll be interest in the Baptist House of Studies at Union Presbyterian, both with it and beyond Virginia. I think what the relationship you all are building with Baptist Seminary of Kentucky to have an explicit Virginia presence uh, from that school. Um, I think there'll be lessons about that all across our fellowship. So um, I, I am eager uh, for what might be and grateful for what's been. So let's shift gears here a little bit. Uh, we know that uh, something big that's been shaping CBF Global for a while is uh, the Toward Bold Faithfulness Initiative. Hmm. Um, I think that people here know those words, um, but can you just tell us kind of the, the major components to Toward Bold Faithfulness? Hmm. Sure. Um, so Toward Bold Faithfulness began as in, in September of 2019, publicly. Um, our governing board and our, our leadership were laying groundwork for it really following the Birmingham General Assembly in June of 2019. So you're talking about something that has been going on my entire time in this job, it's pretty much this. Um, and it started out as a desire. So CBF this summer celebrates our 30th birthday. And we felt like as we prepared for the beginning of our fourth decade of ministry and mission, we needed to deeply and substantially engage our congregations and our leaders in listening for God's call for the next stage of our life together. And so we, we recognized that discovering and responding to that call was gonna really involve at least two distinct uh, kinds of work. First of all, we were gonna 
be trying to discover what our focus in ministry and mission should be going forward. And then we got to figure out how to organize ourselves to respond to that calling, whatever it was. And we were very intentional from the beginning in separating those things because the gifts required for spiritual discovery or vocational discovery are not always the same as the gifts required to organize a response. And so we committed in the fall of 2019 to deep engagement and listening across our fellowship. Um, and we, we committed to doing several different kinds of listening to try to discover where our focus should be in this next season of our mission and ministry. And um, the most widely obvious kind of listening was the Toward Bold Faithfulness Survey, <laughs> which was completed by congregations in January and February of 2020. And, you know, we had uh, 4,900 and some Baptists from 762 congregations, 80% of the respondents were lay people in their congregations, respond to that survey. Wow. And as far as I know, that is the most engagement we've had in any such process in CBS history. The fact that in 2020, almost 5,000 people would take more than 20 minutes to respond to the survey about the future of a denominational organization is just remarkable. Yep. It's just remarkable. Um, and the 760 congregations represented come from small towns and large cities. There's a wide range of like theological and mission and ministry diversity in those surveys. So we know we heard from a representative sample of our fellowship. Um, but we also listened in other ways. Um, that discovery process was led by a discovery team that our governing board and its officers appointed. And you know they conducted individual interviews with some folks identified by the leaders of our ministry networks in CBS who might bring a different kind of perspective than just the folks who completed the survey. And we also did really detailed listening sessions. I mean, you participated in some of them with leaders of our state regional organizations, our field personnel, our staff indicator, leaders of partner organizations, um, so that we were having really three different ways of listening. <laughs> Believe it or not, Mark, the discovery process reached its most significant moment a year ago this week. Wow. The last meeting we hosted in person indicator across the street at First Baptist was the second retreat of the discovery team. And it was the retreat where the discovery was supposed to happen. Hmm. It, the discovery wasn't rigged in advance and imposed on the team. They were given the data. They were given the prayer experiences. They made the discovery of what were the most powerful gifts given to our fellowship and what are the most urgent needs we're supposed to meet with those gifts. Um, they had a powerful three-day retreat, March 9th, 10th, and 11th of 2020, and left with an outline of the discovery in view. None of us who celebrated communion together that morning of March, Wednesday, March 11th, I think knew that we would not do that in person for at least a year mm. when we left. We knew the world was shifting around us. We didn't know how profoundly. Um, but that's when what we finally published on Memorial Day, around Memorial Day of, of the discovery, first came into view. And you can go to the CBF website and see that we identified powerful gifts in our fellowship, powerful gifts in our congregations, alongside urgent needs in our congregations, our communities, and in, in all of CBF. Um, those urgent needs of our congregations were things like uh, financial strain, <laughs> uh, navigating change, the number of changes that our congregations were facing even before the pandemic, just startling. Um, help having difficult conversations about really sensitive matters. Um, need for further clarity about their own sense of vision and calling. Um, just really important um, needs in their life, as well as help with engaging the rapidly uh, diversifying world around them. Um, but at the same time, needs in our communities in the world came into sharp focus. Things like hunger, <laughs> racial justice and reconciliation, poverty, uh, the needs of immigrants, um, the need for deep connection. Um, these all arose. And remember, all these needs came into view and in listening done before the pandemic. And all the pandemic did was reinforce and intensify what we already heard. So we came out of that with a real sense that as a fellowship, we need to be using the gifts the Spirit had given us 
to help congregations meet the needs they had voiced so they might help meet the needs that existed in their communities and around the world. And so then the question was, how do we organize ourselves to do that? <laughs> and so at General Assembly last summer, um, we started what was called the response phase of Toward Bold Faithfulness. And that's where we started asking like organizational questions. How do we work together better in the CBF to meet these needs? How do we surround congregations more effectively? How can we carry out our ministry in more financially sustainable ways? Um, you know, what's the best approach to deploying the tremendous gifts we've been given to help meet these needs? Um, and coming out of that response phase, <laughs> I would say that there is a growing emphasis on living into the first part of our name, cooperative. So as you know, we've decided that um, if we're going to really surround congregations and help them thrive and help them meet the needs they're facing, we need a, an even closer kind of collaboration between CBF state and regional organizations and CBF here in Decatur. There's some things that state regional organizations are better equipped to do than we are here in Decatur. But there are also some things that we're uniquely positioned to do because we don't serve just a single state or a single region. We, we, we uh, have a, a more global perspective. And so how do we bring like the unique gifts and opportunities of CBF states and regions alongside CBF Global and partners in the most collaborative, generative way? And so since October, you've been in some of them, there've been a lot of them. We've been having a lot of conversations about how we cooperate better and organize our resources better so that every dollar congregations give to CBF can be used in ways that really meet the needs or more fully leverage the gifts that were revealed in Toward Bold Faithfulness, along with making sure that we are constant. So another hunch we had going in, Mark, uh, that was confirmed by this whole process is for CBF to really flourish and thrive, we can't get entrenched in the wrong kind of institutionalism. We have to be agile. We have to be responsive. We have to be constantly paying attention to the needs of congregations and their leaders because the five urgent needs of congregations that emerged a year ago, those will change. We'll make some progress on some of them, but new needs will arise. And so one of our goals going in was that we'd create a culture of listening and responding and collaborating so that five years from now, we don't have to create another blue ribbon committee to start over again. But that we would not just come away with, from this year with a set of priorities, but with some practices and some ways of supporting congregations and extending a witness around the world that would, uh, would serve us well and lead us to thrive long after the process is over. So that's the kind of eight and 10 minute um, overview of that process and, and where we are right now. Right now, we're really leaning into how do we cultivate the most excellent collaborations or cooperations in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship for the benefit of our congregations, for the sake of Christ's mission in our communities around the world. So with Toward Bold Faithfulness, how do you think that process has positioned CBF uniquely to meet the needs of a post-pandemic uh, world? That's a great question. Um, and, and, and pretty early in the pandemic, I came to the personal conclusion that Toward Bold Faithfulness had stopped being the name of a process and started being a way of life for congregations and for CBF and for our field personnel and our chaplains and our church starters and our Together Hope practitioners, um, our theological school leaders, um, because the urgent needs were only becoming more urgent and the powerful gifts are only becoming more powerful and the agility at the heart of that process was going to be our way of life going forward. That agility is not something we created. It's been in the church's DNA since Acts. Mm -hmm. We're trying to tap into some primal impulses about openness and availability to the, the agile Holy Spirit <laughs> that's always giving us the gifts we need to respond to whatever challenges emerge. Um, so, you know, 
even as we were moving from the discovery process to the response process, CBF was repositioning ourselves to try to support congregations in the early days of the pandemic. We essentially had to throw out all of our normal ways of operating so we come up with a new way for the pandemic moment. And you did the same thing in CBF Virginia and every single one of our congregations did too. Um, I think as congregations and their leaders prepared to move out of the coronavirus pandemic into whatever comes next, um, the need for something like Cooperative Baptist Fellowship will be more powerful than it's ever been. Because while we can absolutely be autonomous local congregations, true to our own consciences, we're going to have to walk with one another and help one another navigate this new world under the leadership of the Spirit. Um, we're going to, you know, we need to be in a situation where pastors and congregational leaders can learn from one another and help one another cultivate uh, agility and tenacity and faithfulness um, so that as we step into this new world that's opening, um, we can do so faithfully. This is not going to be an era of a, an old-fashioned denominational three-step program for emerging from the pandemic. It is going to be a season where we need each other desperately to help one another figure this out and find our way in faith, in courage, in boldness, <laughs> toward just reconciliation, um, resurrection, joy, and a love that doesn't let go. Mm. And so, you know, from the beginning of the Christian faith, it's never been an individual operation. People following Jesus have always been drawn into community by Jesus because Jesus knew we would need to walk alongside each other to get anywhere. But when you're navigating really um, unexplored spaces, being in community with others and with the global church, it's just incredibly important. Um, so I, I think the listening, the agility, the relationships, the cooperation that has started to come into focus during that process really all uniquely position us to respond to this moment that none of us could have imagined when we first rolled out this process in September of 2019. And that may be its greatest gift. So I know our time is drawing short, mm -hmm. um, but I do want to give you the space just to um, tell us about your hopes and dreams for CBF. So, I mean, my last response brought me into that neighborhood, but you know, I, so two years ago when I started this work, um, I did so in a conviction that our fellowship was called to a unique way of supporting congregations and their leaders and extending Christ's mission in our communities and around the world that was absolutely necessary and distinctly faithful that we were uniquely positioned to live out. Um, I don't think the world has any need right now in 2021 for denominations of the sort that came to, to flourish in the middle of the last century. I don't, I don't think 1960 is gonna come and ask for its denomination back. <laughs> But I do think there is a tremendous need for a community that helps connect congregations and their leaders with one another, to support one another, to learn from each other, to navigate change and challenge together and come together to do work in our communities and in the world that none of us can do on our own. I think that kind of cooperation, um, that kind of life together is inspiring and is hopeful. And I think in this, in this time, especially the need for truly genuine 
uh, collaboration and cooperation to strengthen congregations and extend Christ's mission, it's just an incredibly powerful opportunity for us. And so, you know, because CBF is not encumbered by owning lots of property, because we don't have uh, rigid structures that come from decades, you know, hundreds of years of existence, we are positioned for that kind of agility. Um, and so we need to tap into it with all the faithfulness we can muster. Um, I'm also really, really hopeful about our fellowship because I get the chance to see and know the incredible people who have responded to God's call to the unique ministry of CBF. Whether it's you and Terry in Virginia or any of our other state and regional leaders across our 19 states and regions, our amazing field personnel <laughs> around the world who in some ways got to in faithful innovation before any of the rest of us uh, and are increasingly unique in the larger global mission world, whether it's our unique commitments to Together for Hope, there are very few denominations. Jason Coker would say none that have made the kind of commitment we have to doing ministry among in context of rural poverty. There's a lot of fascination with urban poverty, but rural poverty, that's a really unique space that God has called us. Um, more than 800 currently serving endorsed chaplains and pastoral counselors. The, you know, deans and faculty at the theological schools in relation with our fellowship. The, these are all individuals. And of course, our staff here in Decatur who are gifted, who are committed, who share a desire to see congregations flourish and Christ's mission advance in unique ways. And when you know people, you have a chance to see the people who have responded to the call to do different parts of this work. It's hard not to be hopeful um, because just as a, your congregations in Virginia are blessed to have really strong pastoral leadership right now, there are really gifted people all around you and me, Mark, <laughs> who are giving themselves oftentimes invisibly to the cultivating of this kind of remarkable community. And it's, you know, that's a, that's a reason for hope. Paul, we're so grateful for your time and your uh, just investment in CBF for Virginia. Um, any final words you want to leave us with? No, I'm just really grateful. Uh, I don't want to miss any chance to speak to any uh, congregations or individuals who are, who are cooperative Baptists without saying thank you. <laughs> thank you for your support of CBF in Virginia. Thank you for your support of CBF. Um, you know, in our Baptist world, we live on the powerful but sometimes dangerous uh, currency of voluntary cooperation. We don't uh, assess apportionments at CBF Life. People give and participate as you feel led by the Spirit and as you decide in your, in your hearts. And so we're grateful for your partnership. We're grateful for the opportunity to be a ministry partner for your congregation. And we just want you to know that that is a a stewardship you place in us that we do not take for granted, for which we are grateful, and for which we are committed to finding more and more excellent ways of carrying out the ministry you've given us. So I think my best word and last word should be thank you. Well, Paul, it's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you again for this time. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be with you. <laughs>